Hi everyone, and welcome to the first lecture of the semester on Chapter 1, Introduction to Biology. Since this is our first lecture, I want to remind you that there will be checkpoint questions that appear throughout the lecture, and so you should have a separate sheet of paper on hand or a Word document pulled up on your computer so that when we reach a checkpoint question, you can pause the lecture, complete the question, uh, and then resume the lecture so that you can get those extra credit points when you turn your checkpoints in. So the purpose of this lecture is going to be to ease us into the principles of both science in general and biology as a specific type of science. So over the course of the lecture, we're going to take this topic apart piece by piece. We're going to first talk about what is science and what are its principles, and then we'll talk about what is biology as a specific type of science. And before we do that, I want to briefly tell you why there has never been a better time to be studying biology. So in recent decades, biology has progressed faster than perhaps any other field of science. And what that means is that biologists, even just 100 years ago, were doing very different things compared to the advanced work that most biologists are doing today. 100 years ago, much of the field of biology involved observation, description, and classification, meaning that biologists were going out into the world and looking at living things, uh, collecting samples of them, drawing pictures of them, maybe cutting them open and trying to figure out how they work on the inside, but just in general trying to get a very rough estimation of what living things are out there and how do they work. Fast forward to today, and the field of biology has become much more sophisticated and so advanced that many different subdisciplines have emerged under the umbrella of biology, from microbiology to plant biology to animal physiology to virology. All of these areas of study exist today underneath biology, and they are all asking much more deep and pointed questions about biological entities because biologists now have the tools and the understanding that they need to do so. So while a hundred years ago a biologist might ask a question like, how many different types of squids are there in the world and what do they look like? Today, biologists ask things like, what are the similarities between the nervous system of squids and humans? Uh, how closely are squids and jellyfish related on a genetic level? Uh, what effect will climate change have on the habitat range of the giant squid? So you can see how these are more meaningful questions. So truly there has never been a better time to be a biologist or to be studying biology because the questions that biologists can tackle are extremely interesting, not to mention important to your everyday lives. And I hope to convince you of this by briefly showing you some examples of this. So here are a few things that biology has accomplished in the past 10 years. If you take a look at this headline, it says FDA approves first gene therapy for leukemia. Leukemia is a type of blood cancer, and this gene therapy involves taking a person's immune system cells out of their body, their white blood cells, genetically engineering their cells in order to teach them how to find and eliminate the cancer, and then putting those cells back into the body so that the body's own immune system is the primary defense against the cancer. This Gene therapy went through clinical trials in cases of pediatric leukemia, meaning that uh, these were cases of leukemia among children, and in particular among children in whom other treatments weren't working. So this was really their last option. And the results of those clinical trials were that 83% of children in the trials went into remission within six months of trying this gene therapy, which is an incredible amount. So that's one incredible thing that biology has done just three years ago. On a little bit lighter note, there are now genetically modified apples that don't get brown when you leave them out in the open air. If any of you are grossed out by browning apples, those are available now. And here's a weird one. Did you know that you can clone your pets? Yes, that's right. You can take a genetic sample of your dog or your cat, you can send it off to a company, and they will give you a genetically identical version of your dog or your cat. It's expensive. It's weird. It's maybe a little bit unethical. Uh, you can look it up. It's Viagen Pets. Um, check it out. And in fact, they will not only give you one of your dog or your cat, they will give you like eight of your dog or your cat because they do multiples. Uh, so I hope these three examples show you that biology is doing some 
incredible, amazing, and also strange things these days. And by the end of this class, you will have a pretty good understanding of how it is accomplishing these things. But before we get too deep into biology, I told you we were going to talk first about science. So that's where we are going to really start this lecture. What is science? Now everyone in this class is probably coming into it with some sense of what science is, with some sort of their own personal understanding of what it means to do science. And in fact, there are a lot of different definitions of science out there if you just take the time to look. Uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines science as the state of knowing, knowledge as distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding. Collins Dictionary defines it as the study of the nature and behavior of natural things and the knowledge that we obtain about them. Wikipedia says that science is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the future. So these three definitions are obviously different, but they have some common themes to them. And I don't want you to know any one of these three definitions by heart. What I want you to know about what science is, is that it aims to understand the natural world through observation and reasoning. Through these two things, observation and reasoning, science aims to understand the natural world. And while that may sound intimidating, what I want you to know is that science is nothing more than a more rigorous version of what we do every single day as we go about making decisions in our everyday lives. And I'll give you an example. So let's say I want to drive from my house to the Central Arizona College Signal Peak campus. And I know that I need to get there at 9 a.m. And so therefore I leave at 8.15. I assume that it will take me 45 minutes to get to campus. And how do I know that? I know that because I've done it before. Therefore, in the past, I have made observations about how long it takes me to get to campus. And therefore, I can reason that if it took 45 minutes in the past, it's going to take 45 minutes again today. So nothing more than observation and reasoning, but with a few more rules thrown into the mix. And we'll talk about what the rules are for observation and reasoning when we're doing science. The goal, of course, of science is a little bit more lofty than just getting to campus on time. The goal is to arrive at conclusions by proposing and testing explanations for natural phenomena. Now, a proposed explanation for a natural phenomenon that you test, this might be something that you've heard of before. It's called a hypothesis. A scientific hypothesis is a proposed explanation of a natural phenomenon or a set of observations that you make. The thing about a hypothesis is that it must be testable. In other words, you have to be able to show whether the hypothesis is true or false through experimentation. If there's no possible way to design an experiment that shows if a hypothesis is true or false, then it's not actually a valid scientific hypothesis. I'll give you an example. So here I have two explanations only one of which you could actually design an experiment to test it. Number one, drinking more water reduces the severity of acne. Number two, tooth fairy magic reduces the severity of acne. Which of these two explanations is actually testable? For which of them could you actually design an experiment to test it? Hopefully you came up with number one, drinking more water reduces the severity of acne. Number two, there's just no way to design an experiment in order to determine whether or not that is the true explanation. Number one, you can envision many different ways to design the experiment, um, but number two, you cannot. So number two is not a valid scientific hypothesis. Number one is a valid scientific hypothesis. This brings us to another scientific concept, which is that of a theory. So a scientific theory is defined as a thoroughly tested and confirmed explanation for a set of observations or phenomena that is accepted as true or factual. Oftentimes, a theory is a harder concept for us to wrap our minds around because the way that the word is used in everyday language is different from the way it is used by scientists. So often people use the word theory in their everyday language in a way that really means a guess or a hypothesis. So one might say, uh, for example, I have a theory 
that my mom is hiding my birthday present under her bed. But that's not really what it means to a scientist, because in the world of science, the word theory is taken very seriously and only used under certain circumstances. Those circumstances being when a hypothesis has been thoroughly tested and confirmed so much that it is now accepted as truth or fact. Here are some examples of well-known theories that have been proposed and then examined and tested over and over and over again and always consistently demonstrated to be true. The theory of universal gravitation, also known as the theory of gravity, theory of plate tectonics, the theory of relativity, the theory of heliocentricity, and the theory of natural selection. So only very special sets of hypotheses get to go on to become theories. Most hypotheses do not get to become theories because they are not true. Only those which are true and get to be tested over and over again and demonstrated to be true multiple times by many people over long periods of time are eventually elevated to the status of being a theory. The process by which hypotheses undergo testing in order to determine whether they can be elevated to the status of a theory is something called the scientific method. And the scientific method may be something that you've heard of before in a previous science class. And you probably learned that it was a five to nine step process that involves first asking a question and making observations, perhaps doing some background research, coming up with a hypothesis and perhaps a prediction, and then designing an experiment to test your hypothesis, analyzing your data and drawing a conclusion, and then reporting your results. And this is what the scientific method will look like for us in this class, because we have a very simple teaching laboratory. But I do want you to also know that in the real world, the scientific method is a lot more messy than this straightforward version that we will be practicing in class. In reality, as hypotheses undergo the testing to become theories, there are many different hypotheses that are competing for the spot as the selected hypothesis. Um, they are all undergoing experiments at different times, conducted by different people in different places, and so it can take a long time and quite a messy runaround process to piece together uh, the real truth that is behind a theory. Um, but of course, what we're doing in this class will look a lot more like the version on the left-hand side with a straightforward step-by-step -step process. What I want to do now is zoom in on one particular step of the scientific method, and that is the testing or the experimentation step. So what goes on when we actually conduct experiments to test the validity, validity of hypotheses. Um, well, one thing that we need to know is that all experiments involve these things called variables. And variables are defined as anything that can change in the experiment. And that makes sense because if you think about what the root word of the word variable is, it is very. And very means to change. So a variable is something that can change. There are two specific types of variables that are important in an experiment, and those are the independent variable and the dependent variable. By definition, the independent variable is the thing that determines the outcome of the dependent variable. Or in other words, the dependent variable is named for the fact that it depends upon something else. And that other thing is the independent variable. Now, if that doesn't make sense, that's okay. We're going to talk about an example of this. Let's say I'm trying to determine whether feeding my chickens more sunflower seeds will cause them to produce more eggs, featuring a picture here of one of my chickens in her Christmas sweater. What is the dependent variable and the independent variable in this experiment? So what is determining what? Let's look back at the question. There are two things in this experiment that can vary. The amount of sunflower seeds in the diet and the amount of eggs produced. One of them depends upon the other. And in fact, it is the number of eggs produced that depends upon the amount of sunflower seeds in the diet. 
This means that the number of eggs produced is the dependent variable, and the amount of sunflower seeds in their diet is the independent variable. So let's say I then design an experiment to test this hypothesis over the course of three days. And here's what I do. On the first day, I feed my chickens four scoops of sunflower seeds at 8 a.m., and I collect their eggs at 5 p.m., and they have produced four eggs. On day two, I feed one additional scoop, five scoops of sunflower seeds, at 9 a.m., and I collect the eggs at 2 p.m., at which point there are two eggs produced. On day three, I feed one more scoop of seeds than the previous day, so this time six scoops of seeds, at 11 a.m., and when I collect the eggs at 5 p.m., there are three of them. What have I learned from this process? Well, actually, I haven't learned anything. And the reason why is because I let too many things change. Sure, I increased the number of scoops of sunflower seeds on successive days, but I fed those sunflower seeds at different times of the day, and I collected the eggs at different times of the day as well. So on day two, who's to say that the reason why there were only two eggs produced is not because of the sunflower seeds, but rather because I fed and collected the eggs at different times? We can't really draw any conclusions because I haven't been consistent in carrying out my experiment. And so this brings us to a very important principle of experimentation that we will be practicing in this class, which is that a well-designed experiment will only test the effect of one variable at a time. In particular, we only wanted to test, in this case, the effect of changing the amount of sunflower seeds. We didn't want to know what the effect was of changing the time that we feed the seeds or the time that we collect the eggs. We only wanted to know about that one variable. So my experiment was useless because the results could have been affected by many different variables or many things that could have changed, including the time of feeding and the time of the egg collection. In a good experiment, all variables need to be held constant, except for the one that you are testing, which again, in this case, was the amount of sunflower seeds. This brings us to our very first extra credit checkpoint question of the lecture. You are trying to determine whether drinking more coffee improves student performance on exams. In this situation, what is the independent variable and what is the dependent variable should you design an experiment to test this question? So take a moment, pause the lecture, come up with your answer and write it down either on a piece of paper or in a Word document, and then when you're ready, resume the lecture and we will move on. We have one more checkpoint before we proceed, checkpoint number two. Let's say you're doing the same experiment with regard to coffee and exam performance. What would be some variables that you would want to control or keep consistent across your test subjects in order to ensure that the results of your experiment are valid and that you can truly draw a conclusion and a connection between coffee and exam performance? Now that we have an understanding of variables, that is, independent and dependent variables, and why it's important to keep all other variables constant, let's say I redid my experiment on my chickens with the sunflower seeds, and this time I controlled all of my variables properly. I collected eggs at the same time of the day, I fed at the same time of the day, and here is the table of results that I got from that properly designed experiment. On day one, I fed one scoop of seeds and collected three eggs. On day two, I fed two scoops of seeds and collected four eggs. On day three, three scoops of seeds and five eggs. And finally, on day four, four scoops of seeds and six eggs. What can we conclude from this data? Well, looking at the data, we can see that there is a clear trend which shows that increasing the amount of sunflower seeds does indeed cause the chickens to produce more eggs. What you did when you arrived at that conclusion was use something called inductive reasoning. You looked at data 
that were produced from an experiment, and you use that data to then perceive and conclude a general trend, which is that more sunflower seeds equals more eggs. That was inductive reasoning. Now, let's look at what would happen if we wanted to make a prediction about what would come next on day five. Were I to feed the chickens five scoops of seeds, how many eggs would I expect to be produced? Well, if the trend follows and holds true, then we should be able to conclude that five scoops of sunflower seeds will lead to seven eggs on the fifth day. What you just did there was an example of something called deductive reasoning. You already knew the trend. You already knew the rule. And then you use that trend to make a prediction about a situation that had not yet come about. So this is deductive reasoning. It is the sister to, but the opposite of inductive reasoning. Here's a graphic to show you more how they are related to each other. When you have experimental data, you do inductive reasoning in order to draw a conclusion from that data. I had my chicken data and I wanted to draw a conclusion from it and we saw using inductive reasoning that more sunflower seeds equals more eggs. Once you have that conclusion, which is that more sunflower seeds equals more eggs, you can then use deductive reasoning to make new predictions about situations that haven't happened yet. So I used my general trend of more sunflower seeds equals more eggs to predict that five scoops would yield seven eggs. So let's put your knowledge of inductive and deductive reasoning to test in a checkpoint. In this checkpoint, we're going to look at Galileo and the theory of heliocentricity, which is the theory that the Earth revolves around the sun and not vice versa. 400 years ago, Galileo proposed this theory using his observations of the solar system. And back in 2017, modern astronomers used that theory in order to predict the exact date, time, and location of the total solar eclipse that happened that year. In each of these two instances, what type of reasoning were the scientists using? What type of reasoning did Galileo use? And what type of reasoning did the astronomers in 2017 use? And because inductive and deductive reasoning are a tricky concept, we have one more checkpoint on them. The theory of natural selection says that organisms that are more well suited to their environment will survive better and produce more offspring. So we have two giraffes here, giraffe A and giraffe B. On the basis of this theory, which you already know to be true, you make a prediction that giraffe B will survive better and produce more offspring than giraffe A. What type of scientific reasoning, either inductive or deductive, did you use when you made that prediction? Another aspect of solid experimental design is incorporating something called an experimental control. The purpose of experimental controls is for scientists to be able to know whether or not the different components of their experiment, such as their instruments, their tools, their measuring tools, their reagents, making sure that all of those things are working in the way that they should. There are two different types of experimental controls. A positive control is a test that you run alongside all of your other tests where you know that it will yield a positive result in the experiment. A negative control, on the other hand, is a test that you run alongside your others that you completely expect will yield a negative result. So if you already know the outcomes of these tests, or at least you know what the outcome should be, what is the purpose of these two different types of controls? Well. Let's look at it in the context of a tool that we are familiar with, which is the under the tongue thermometer, which I'm sure everyone has used before for taking body temperature. Let's say you think you may be sick with a fever, but you're not sure if your thermometer is working properly. You think it might be giving you the incorrect temperature. You know for a fact that your brother is sick with a fever and your sister is healthy. 
how could you use this information to determine whether your thermometer is working properly? Well, first, let's think about what it is you're testing for. You're testing for the presence of a fever. In which individual do you expect a positive result? Well, that would be your brother. Your brother you know to be sick, you know that he has a fever, and therefore you could give him the thermometer. And if it shows that he has a fever, then that means that it's working properly. In that sense, your brother could act as the positive control. On the other hand, in which individual do you expect a negative result? That would be your sister. Your sister represents the negative control because if you give her the thermometer and ask her to take her temperature, you know and expect that it will come back without a fever because she's healthy. What would it mean if the thermometer reported a normal temperature in your brother when you know that he has a fever? Well, that would mean the thermometer is not working properly. Likewise, what would it mean if the thermometer reported a fever in your sister? That would also mean that it's not working properly because you know that she does not have a fever. This is the power of positive and negative controls. They can tell you whether or not your instruments and your tools are working properly. So let's take a look at a checkpoint on this subject. Living in Arizona, um, you may be familiar with swimming pools and you may know that swimming pools need to have certain ratios of chemicals in them and that if a swimming pool is too acidic, it is generally not considered safe to swim in. You may have also seen that these little strips of paper called pH test strips can be used to test the acidity levels and other chemical levels in the pool water and determine if it is safe. So let's say you have these pH test strips and you want to use them to determine whether or not there is too much acid in the pool. Describe how you would set up a positive and negative control for this experiment to determine whether or not your pH test strips are working properly. Because it is the case that these test strips can expire and after a certain amount of time they will not give you the correct result. How would you set up an experiment with a positive and a negative control to determine if the test strips are still correctly showing the difference between a acidic pH or a basic pH. One final aspect of experimentation that we want to talk about here before we move on is something called sample size. Sample size describes the number of times that a specific test is carried out. And in general, the larger the sample size, the more reliable the results of your experiment are. Let's take a look at a specific example of why this might be the case. Let's say we wanted to ask the question, what is the average height of an adult human? Which of these would be a better test to answer that question? Measuring the height of four students in our class or measuring the height of everyone at CAC? It should be obvious that measuring the height of everyone at CAC would give you a more accurate result because measuring the height of only four students, the results could be skewed. What if those four students just happen to be very short or very tall? If you measure the height of a larger number of people, then you have a larger sample size that gives you a more accurate depiction of what the true answer is. So to summarize good experimental practice in this one part of the scientific method, we should only test one variable at a time and keep all others constant. We should use valid scientific reasoning, such as inductive or deductive. We should apply, apply experimental controls, the positive and negative controls, in order to determine whether or not our instruments are working properly. And then finally, we should use as large of a sample size as possible to get the most accurate result. We are nearly done discussing the principles of science here. I have one final checkpoint for you to complete before we move on to talking about biology. And that is, I want you to describe to me your understanding of the distinction between a hypothesis and a theory. Now that we've finished talking about the nature and the principles of science in general, we're going to move on to talking about the principles of biology. Now you probably already know coming into this class that biology is the study of living organisms, things that are alive. But 
this includes a very wide range of things. Uh, everything that is on this slide right now is actually something that is considered a biological living organism, from trees to microscopic organisms like bacteria or water bears, uh, animals like ourselves, uh, and more. And so with such a wide range of characteristics and things that fall under this category of biology, what is it that unites these things? What is it that distinguishes the study of biology from the study of non-living organisms? Well, it turns out that scientists agree that there are certain properties that are shared by living organisms which non-living things do not possess. In particular, there are eight different properties which are possessed by living organisms, some of which may be possessed by non-living organisms, but for something to be alive, it has to have all eight of these things. And those eight things are sensitivity or response to stimuli, reproduction, adaptation, growth and development, regulation, homeostasis, energy processing, and order. And we're going to walk through these one by one and talk about what they mean. Let's start with sensitivity or response to stimuli. What this means is that living organisms all share in common that they are able to respond to signals from their environment. There are many examples of this that span the world of life. Ones that are more familiar to you are things that apply to humans and that are obvious to us. For example, um, when you touch something that's especially hot and you burn yourself, you automatically jerk your hand away from it. That is you responding to a signal from your environment. But other living organisms that are not humans also do this as well. Sunflowers, for example, track the movement of the sun. The direction that the flower faces actually changes over the course of the day, and it follows the movement of the sun from the east to the west across the sky. That is the plant responding to the signal, the sunlight, from its environment. Even microscopic organisms do this. What we see in this animation right here is microscopic organisms, bacteria, swarming toward a sugar crystal in their environment, as seen through a microscope. They are able to detect that there is a food source in their environment, and they move towards it accordingly. So all organisms, from small to large and everything in between, all respond to signals from their environment. The next characteristic is reproduction. All organisms, from small to large, reproduce additional organisms of their same kind. This includes animals, this includes plants, and this includes microscopic organisms like this euglena right here, which you can see is actually developing a cleft because it is undergoing reproduction and splitting straight down the middle so that one cell becomes two. Next is adaptation. All living organisms are able to evolve adaptations that enhance their survival under their specific set of circumstances and in their environment. One particularly relevant example of this is in microscopic organisms that are capable of evolving antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is the ability of certain infectious bacteria to resist the drugs, the antibiotics that we would normally use to treat those infections by killing them. There is a growing rate of bacteria that are resistant to those antibiotics, meaning that those drugs have no effect on them. And the reason why antibiotic resistance is growing is because bacteria are evolving and adapting to our increased use of antibiotics so that they are better able to survive in their environment. Other examples that are less threatening to us, um, we can see in nature uh, examples of animals that are particularly well suited to their environment in terms of camouflage. This arctic fox right here has evolved a white colored coat that allows it to blend in with its environment and become a better predator. We can also see this in the world of plants. Um, Saguaro cactuses are a great example of a plant that has evolved specific adaptations that allow it to survive well in a very harsh desert environment, such as having spines on its surface, as well as having water storing mechanisms that allow it to go long periods of time without rain. Next is growth and development. All living organisms grow, mature, and develop the traits that are encoded in the genes that were passed down from their parents. 
Of course, here I have another example from my own menagerie of pets. This is my goat Fiona when she was a little baby. And here she is grown up into the big, beautiful goat that she is today. Next is regulation. Organisms have complex methods by which they regulate their various functions, some of which you are probably familiar with. For example, some mammals, including humans, are able to sweat in order to regulate and cool their body temperature. An example from the world of plants comes to us in the form of cactus flowers. Cactus flowers you may know open and close at different times of the day. And uh, even in the world of microbes, this is true. E. coli bacteria produce digestive enzymes for the milk sugar lactose only when it is present and available as a food source in their environment. When there is no lactose, they don't make those special digestive enzymes and they are able to regulate themselves in that manner. Next is homeostasis. Homeostasis is defined as the ability of organisms to maintain stable internal conditions, which includes temperature and pH. For example, polar bears are able to maintain a high internal body temperature despite living in a very cold environment because they have many insulating layers of fat and fur that prevent their heat from escaping. That's one example of homeostasis. Humans uh, we can get another example with our blood pH. Humans are able to consume alcohol up to a certain point without causing their blood to become too acidic. And of course, this limit can be exceeded. However, we have a special buffering system in our blood, which prevents the acid-base balance from being thrown off too much, even when we consume highly acidic substances. Next is energy processing. All living organisms have to obtain energy and process it, and that energy can come from various sources. The primary two places where organisms get their energy is chemical energy, or what we would think of as food, and in other organisms such as plants and some microbes, sunlight serves as the primary source of energy. And last but not least, we have order. All living things are highly organized in their composition, and that organization is consistent from organism to organism. At the most basic level, living things are made of special molecules that are constructed into cells. And in multicellular organisms, these molecules and cells are then built into tissues, organs, organ systems, and bodies. We are going to be walking through the different levels of biological order um, which go from macromolecules to organelles to cells, to tissues to organs to organ systems. And in particular, in the very first unit of this class, we're going to be focusing on the three most basic levels of biological organization and order, which is macromolecules, organelles, and cells. So stay tuned for that. That's coming up in our first unit lectures. So those are the eight properties that are shared by all living organisms. And we're gonna round this lecture out with a checkpoint. During the Voyager missions to Mars back in the 1970s, an experiment was conducted on samples of Martian soil that showed that there was some evidence of metabolism going on inside of the soil. In other words, the soil appeared to be processing energy. Does that mean that the Voyager missions proved that there are soil microbes living on Mars? Why or why not? And once you have completed this checkpoint, you're finished with the very first lecture. Congratulations, and I will see you in the Chapter 2 lecture.